Today's jump start is from Galatians chapter 5, verses 2 through 4. How not to fall from grace by trying to earn God's love, favor, and righteousness. We are jump starting our way through Galatians chapter 3. And uh, man, it has been pa- powerful. I thought I could get through it in about eight or nine jump starts. And man, that hasn't been the case. And it's okay because we're speaking the word of God. We're hearing it, feeding on it, fellowshipping with each, other, each other, and speaking the word of God. Praise God. Hallelujah. That's awesome, Shar. Praise God. You have a ministry with the Amish and the Mennonite community. That is awesome. Praise God. Man, and that's, uh, Melissa, that's so precious. It's it's going good, so good. If you have to miss, they say, please don't miss because they love it. Man, that is awesome. The word of God that you're ministering to these women, I'm just so excited about that. Praise God. That is awesome. Awesome, your ministry. We have another uh, evangelist in our church, Barry Banta, who his He's reaching the Amish and uh, getting them, the the young men especially, born again and spirit-filled speaking with tongues. It's rocking their world. Sharon, good morning. Good to see you. Praise God, Rhea and I love you. So glad we finally got to meet you in Illinois. And your precious son, Stephen, Dr. Castle, and his wife. Praise God, we were so blessed to be Hang out with you guys in Illinois. That was awesome. Chastity, good morning. Amen. All right. Praise God. God is good. Hey, praise God. Hey, Kelly on Rumble. Okay, good to see you. Praise the Lord. All right. Ephes- or Galatians chapter 3. Uh, and again, many of you are taking notes. You do take notes, and I think that's awesome because I'm just expecting the Spirit of God to say some things and do some things and I'm excited about it. Praise God. So in Galatians, again, this is our charter of freedom. This is Paul's, one of his most edgy. uh, uh, He was really very um, pushy. That's not the right word. He was coming strong because he was concerned that these new converts were going to come under legalism and religious bondage and condemnation and rules and regulations and forfeit uh, forfeit their inheritance of the, of a spirit-led, spirit-filled life. And they were going to turn over being moved by the Spirit, led by the Spirit, empowered by the Spirit of God and the Spirit of grace. And they were going to exchange that for legalism, following the rules, keeping the law of Moses, keeping, keeping the, the Jewish laws, and keeping the, in other words, trying to clean up their own act and trying to live by their own strength. And trust in their own ability to, to clean themselves up um, instead of trusting the spirit of grace and the grace of God to work in them. And so Paul is coming on strong. In fact, he came on stronger toward the Galatians when they were falling into legalism and bondage and things of that nature. Uh, he, he was coming on stronger with the Galatians than he did with the Corinthians. With the Corinthians, I mean, they were immoral It was bad, man. They were immoral. Um, They had sexual immorality. They were doing idol worship. They were misusing the gifts of the Spirit. They were dealing with uh, rebellion among the women and the the headpiece and and, uh, just um, all kinds of um, performance issues. But he didn't come off strong. He basically said, you're the temple of the Holy Spirit. Don't you know that you're the temple of God? And he exhorted them. But he never called the Corinthians fools, even though they had all kinds of idolatry. They had sexual perversion. They had they had uh, a, a man sleeping with. Anyway, it was horrible. But he never came off nearly as strong with the Corinthians as he did with the Galatians. And here's why: the Corinthians were not rejecting the grace of God, and so he knew sooner or later that their bad behavior and their bad performance would. The grace of God that they were believing, his grace, the finished work of the cross that they were believing would eventually clean that up. But with the Galatians, 
the Corinthians, no problem, but the Galatians, they were abandoning the grace of God for another false gospel based on rules, regulations, and works. And he understood that if they go, if they leave the grace of God, there's nothing left to help them with the immorality. And we know this to be true, 1 Corinthians 15, 51, or no, 1 Corinthians 15, 56, he said, the sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. The strength of sin is the law. Condemnation, the law. Don't do this. Don't do that. Drink this. Don't drink that. Eat this. Don't eat that. Clean up your act. Get your act together. Straighten up. Straighten yourself up. You better do this. You better do that. If you don't do this, God's going to get you, and God's going to judge you, and God's going to do this. And if if you'll do this, God will bless you. And if you'll do that good thing, God will bless you and answer your prayers. He said that is the strength of sin. That kind of performance preaching will make sin even more powerful in your life. There's a powerful thing that he says in Galatians. I'm getting ahead of myself, and we'll come back when we get to Galatians chapter 5. But you need to hear it right now. In Galatians chapter 5, verse 2, he said, Indeed, I, Paul, say to you that if you become circumcised, Christ will profit you nothing. Think about that. If you become circumcised, in other words, if you start trying to do things in your body, do things in the flesh, change your outward appearance, circumcise yourself, change your outward behavior, work on all the outward performance, he said, the anointing, Christ, the anointed one and his anointing, it'll profit you nothing. Because as long as you're focused on the outside, you're focused on fixing your your performance, cutting your flesh, fixing your performance, you're not even yielding to the Christ that's on the inside of you. You're ignoring the one that's on the inside because you're so focused on what's on the outside. And I tell you, most preaching, most teaching in most churches, I'm even, even the modern, cool, uh, jean wearing, coffee drinking, flip flop wearing, short wearing, t-shirt wearing, hip, cool, hipster churches are still preaching a performance theology. They really are. They're not focused on the Christ that's in them. They're not focusing on the God that's in them, the grace that's on the inside of them. And so he said, if that's the case, because you're not even focused on the anointed one in you, he'll profit you nothing. In other words, God wants God wants Christ in you to profit you. If you'll learn to listen to the anointed one in your spirit, You will profit in every area, including your finances, your marriage, your relationships. Listen to the anointed one that's in you. Don't be so focused on cuttings in the flesh and fixing your flesh and changing your outward behavior and getting all focused on your outward performance. That's not going to help you. But focus on the Christ that's on the inside of you. We want Christ to profit you. Verse 3, and I testify again to every man who becomes circumcised that he is a debtor to keep the whole law. You're a, you, you make yourself a debtor. See, Jesus paid the debt. But when you come back under the, the Jewish law and you get circumcised, when you're circumcised, that's your initiation into law keeping. You see, if you're going to be circumcised, you got to not just be circumcised. you got to keep the whole law. It's not just being circumcised. See, these Judaizers said if you'll just be circumcised, then you're qualified for God's blessing. He said, no. If, you, if you're going to start out trusting your flesh, then you're going to have to trust your flesh to keep the whole law. Now, for those of you that don't know, the law is more than the Ten Commandments. The law is made up of 613. All right? It's, 13, it's 613 commandments. That's true, Nancy. So very true. You know, it's powerful. Yeah, it's powerful. You believe your most prevalent sin has always been allowing self-condemnation. You love the teaching on condemnation no more. I really need this update. I I agree. I agree. We need to because condemnation, self-condemnation is insidious. It creeps in slowly. In fact, without the Holy Spirit and the Word of God, you'll come back under trying to fix yourself, improve yourself, Think you got to pray good, pray better. If you're not praying good enough, if you're not studying the word enough, if you're not 
uh, if you're not praying enough, if you're not spiritual enough, whatever those enoughs are, if the word enough is in it, you're back under condemnation. I'm not doing this enough. I'm not doing that enough. I need to do more. I'm not doing enough. Well, how much is enough? Because once you once you do what you think's enough, your flesh and your mind will tell you that's still not enough. How much is enough? See, that's when you know you're under condemnation when you don't know when enough is enough. Amen. Praise God. Now, when it comes to praying in tongues, I tell you what, you can't pray in tongues enough. The more you pray, the better it is. But you're not trying to move God. You're not trying to get God to bless you. You're just taking advantage of something that's supernatural, you know. But uh, in James, I want you to see this. He said, if you become circumcised, then you are a debtor to keep the whole law. Now, what does that mean? If you're going to keep one part of it, circumcision, then you've obligated to keep all of it. That means that if you're going to go the route of cleaning yourself up, fixing yourself up so that God can honor you and God can bless you and God can answer your prayers and God can heal you and and God, God won't even listen to you unless you get to a certain place, then uh, if that's how you're going to do this, I want you to look at James chapter 1. No, James chapter 2, verse 10. Watch this, James 2, 10. For whoever shall keep the whole law, all 613 commandments. That's how many is in the first five books of the Bible. There are 613 commandments. And they have to not only be kept physically, you have to keep them with your attitude. Okay, so he says, whoever shall keep the whole law, okay, and yet stumble just in one point, in one, just stumble in one of those 630, just stumble, just just mess it up just a little bit, one point in that law, he is guilty of all. Did you hear that? If you keep the whole law, if you've kept the whole law, Let's say you're 90 years old and you've never broken one commandment, all 613 of them. You've got them memorized. You've kept them not only outwardly, but you've kept the spirit of it. You've kept it in your mind, your heart, your attitude. You've never violated one of those 613 laws ever, which is impossible, by the way. But let's just say, hypothetically, you kept all 613 perfectly on the inside, on the outside. But just before you die... You just slightly violate one part of that law, one of those 613, one point of it. You are guilty of breaking the whole law. Let's just say maybe you, uh, you, you know, you're about to die and somebody, uh, maybe there uh, spills coffee on you and you yell and you get angry. Ow, that hurt. Stop it. And you become rude. You just broke the law because one of the 613 laws is don't do that. But um, so if, if you're basing it on the law because he broke that law just by getting mad at the person spilling coffee, if you're basing it on the law, then that guy is going to hell. And not only that, if you break one part of the law, you broke the whole law. So not only is he a, an angry yeller, but he's also considered an adulterer. He's considered a murderer. He's considered a liar, a cheater, a scandaler. He's, he's, he's considered uh, a perjurer. Every law, if you break one, you broke them all. It's like a glass. It's like a plate piece of plate glass. If you throw a rock and break the glass and it just puts a hole through the glass, you still, even a BB through it, you still broken the whole thing. They're, the whole glass is ruined. So we, want, we don't want to try to go this route of trying to qualify for God's blessings and try to qualify for answered prayer, Okay. Uh, our righteousness is not based on how well we straighten up ourselves, how how well we clean up our act. Our righteousness is based on Jesus's performance. Jesus earned our righteousness. He earned our right to be blessed. He earned our right for God's love. He earned our right for God to answer prayer. He earned our healing for us. He earned our prosperity for us. He earned it all. It was all based on his perfect work, not ours, we simply get in on it by believing, by receiving. That's Somebody says that's too good to be true. Yeah, it really is. Praise God. But that is the essence of the gospel. The undeserving get what they don't deserve. And Jesus, the deserving, he got what he didn't deserve, 
which is all of our curse and all of our pain and punishment on the cross. It's called the unfairness of the gospel. Jesus was unfairly cursed with your curses, unfairly sick with your sicknesses, unfairly impoverished with your poverty, unfairly cursed by God and rejected so that you could be unfairly blessed, unfairly healed, unfairly prospered, unfairly favored, unfairly loved. I don't want fair. I want unfair. Jesus was unfairly cursed so that I'm unfairly blessed. Man, this is awesome. It is, Daniel. It's a great exchange. Exactly, man. The great exchange. And that's what the word reconciliation means. It means the great exchange. Say this out loud. Thank God for the unfairness of the gospel. Jesus was unfairly judged. Jesus was unfairly condemned. Jesus was cursed unfairly so that I am blessed unfairly. I'm healed unfairly. I'm favored and it's not fair. I acknowledge that my blessings are not because of fairness. Praise God. This is amazing. This is absolutely amazing. Absolutely. It was a tremendous, great exchange. Now, then he says in Galatians 5, and I'm way ahead of myself, Galatians 5, we'll cover it again. He said, uh, I'm a debtor to keep the whole law. Now, watch verse 4, Galatians 5, 4. You have become estranged from Christ. He's talking to Christians. He's talking to Galatian Christians. You know, it's possible to be born again and become a stranger to the anointed one and his anointing. He said, you have become estranged from Christ, you who attempt to be justified by law. You have fallen from grace. You know, there's so much in this verse. Who fell from grace here? It wasn't the ones that had sin in their life. That's not who fell from grace. The ones that fell from grace were the ones that were trying to earn God's blessing, trying to earn God's favor, trying to earn the status of righteousness by keeping the law. They had fallen from grace. It wasn't, you know, we've often heard people say, well, you know, that pastor got into adultery and fell from grace. Well, you know, probably the one that fell from grace was not just that pastor. And that pastor fell from grace because he didn't trust the grace of God to walk in the holiness of God. He was trusting his own flesh, probably doing ministry in his own strength, probably trying to do life in his own power. And because he was yielding to his flesh in moral living, he yielded to the same flesh in his immoral living. What I just said is worth the whole jump start. I'll say it again. Because that pastor was yielding to his flesh in moral living, trying to use his own flesh to be moral, trying to yield, depend on his own strength, his own flesh to do the ministry, to to fulfill the ministry, doing it, wasn't trusting the unmerited favor of God, wasn't trusting the anointing in him, he was trusting his own strength. Because he yielded to his flesh in morality, he also yielded to his flesh in immorality. Moral flesh and immoral flesh is still flesh. The Jesus didn't come to make us moral. He didn't come to make the wrong right. He came to make the dead alive. He came to make the dead live, not to make the immoral moral. If you're trying to be moral in your own fleshly strength, you're going to also yield to the immorality of your flesh. It's a two-edged sword. I quit trying to do good and be good in my own strength a long time ago. A lot of pastors have fallen into sin because they were trying to accomplish the plan and purpose and will of God, trying to do the ministry in their own flesh, in their own strength. You could say strength and flesh mean the same thing. My flesh, my strength, my ability. And because they were yielding to their flesh and trying to fulfill the ministry, They yielded to their flesh and got caught up in adultery. Amen. 
I live from the position that without Jesus, I am nothing. Without I, I don't trust my flesh farther than I could throw it. I cannot. And that's what Jesus said to me about a month ago. He says, Mario, you're not smart enough. You're not smart enough to fulfill your ministry. You're not smart enough to build this church. You're not smart enough to change lives. You're not smart enough to preach right. You're not smart enough to be married right. You're not smart enough to be a grandfather. You're not smart enough to be a husband or a dad. You're not smart enough to invest your money right. You're not smart enough to do what I've called you to do. He said, but I gave you a gift called praying in tongues. And he said, get busy praying in tongues because you're not even smart enough to know what to pray for as you ought, Romans 8, 26. He said, but if you'll just begin to pray in the Spirit day in and day out, as you go about your day, pray under your breath. Amen, Sharon, without Jesus, we are nothing. But, right, Sharon, we're not without Jesus. We have Christ in us. But if we're depending on our own flesh, we're estranged. And that's what he said here in in Galatians chapter 5. He says, you have become estranged from Christ. You know, it's possible to be born again, spirit-filled. These Galatians, listen, these Galatians, listen to this. In Galatians chapter 3, and I've never seen this connection. This is a hijacking right now. You're watching a revelation happen right now to a preacher. I've never seen these two verses before, but in Galatians chapter 3, Verse 5, he said, Therefore, he who supplies the Spirit to you and works miracles among you, does he do it by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Is he working miracles among you because you've got kept all the rules and you got your act together? No, he said, you simply believe the grace of God that you were made righteous by faith, made righteous by grace. And he said, because of that, the Spirit of God's being supplied to you and miracles are happening. So this is a group of people that have experienced the miraculous power of the Holy Spirit. They've seen miracles. And yet over here, these very ones that have experienced the miraculous power of God are now estranged from the very Christ, the very spirit that was working those miracles. You know, it's possible to be a miracle worker and be estranged from the Christ that's in you. Because gifts don't come because you're spiritual. Gifts are given. I don't give gifts to my kids and my grandkids on Christmas because they earned them. It's possible to flow in the gifts of the Spirit, and yet you've become estranged from the lovely one on the inside of you. I don't know how that happens, but it does. It happened right here. They had miracles working among them. Now, probably what had happened is because they got no end of rule-keeping and legalism and yielding to their flesh, the miracles had probably dried up and ceased and been cut off. And now these ones who had experienced the miraculous power of God, the signs and wonders, he said, you have become estranged. You've become a stranger to Christ. You're no longer even familiar with the Christ that's on the inside of you. You're so focused on your flesh and what's happening on the outside, you're not even yielding to the Christ that's in you anymore. You're trusting in yourself instead of him. And then he said this uh, again, and we're going to close. It says, you who attempt to be justified or made righteous by law, not by the law, by law, you know, by law. Well, different people, even beyond the 613 laws of the Jewish law, we have our own laws. You know, if you gain weight, you feel condemned. I need to lose weight or God won't love me or I'm too fat or God won't love me or, or I'm ugly, I don't look good or I'm not as... I'm not as gifted as that person in church, and I don't have this going on, and my marriage isn't perfect, and I don't have the right marriage, and my kids haven't turned out right. If my kids haven't turned out right, then God can't use me. And we have all these different laws. And he said, the minute you attempt to be righteous by keeping a certain standard, certain outward standard, he said, you have fallen from grace. You're no longer trusting the grace of God. You're trusting yourself to earn what's been given to you for free. Say this out loud. Just say this out loud. I refuse to become estranged from Christ. I refuse to attempt to be justified by law. I cannot clean up my own act. I don't have to pull myself up by my own bootstraps. I know, right, Shar? Amen. Say this out loud. I refuse to be estranged from Christ. And I will not fall from grace. 
by trying to earn righteousness. I am the righteousness of God, purely by grace, through faith. And because I'm the righteousness of God, the blessing of God abounds in my life. I am blessed, and I'm a major blessing. I cannot do today in my own strength. Without Jesus, I'm nothing. But by the grace of God and by Christ in me, I'm living a powerful day today. I'm blessed and not cursed. Because of the perfect performance of Jesus. Here we go. Last one for the week. You ready? Here we go. Say it out loud. I can do all things through Christ who is strengthening me right now. You know why Christ is strengthening you? Because without Christ, you're weak. I don't care how strong you think you are. I don't care how strong we think our willpower is. I don't care how smart we think we are, how slick we think we are, how wise we think we are, how holy and moral we think we are. You need to be strengthened. That's why he's in there to strengthen you. Say it out loud. I'm intimate with Christ within me. Last time, I can do all things through Christ. Through Christ. Say it again. Through Christ who strengthens me. The Greek word through is the word dia. It can also mean on account of or because of. So really you could say, I can do all things because of Christ who is strengthening me. The word strengthen is in the present tense means it's constantly happening. He doesn't do it one time and he's done. It's not like he did strengthen you and you live in that. No, he's constantly strengthening you. He's constantly strengthening you. Hey, Mary. Hey, listen, Mary. McCarty, go back and listen to it. You don't want to miss it. You don't want to miss it. Praise God. Amen. So depend on the strengthening power of Christ. Don't trust your flesh any further than you can throw it. Love you guys. We'll get back to Galatians 3. Ooh, I jumped ahead. Ah, I love you. Have an awesome day. Hey, Rumble. Love you guys. Make sure you shout it out. God is so good. Have a blessed weekend and be a blessing. Oh, and this is Friday. I don't know. We get any testimonies of people praying for somebody. Did you ask to pray for someone? Did you ask to pray for someone? I know that Paige Grayson showed a friend of hers the video, the jumpstart from last week where I talked about being filled with the Holy Spirit. She showed it to her friend and he received the Holy Spirit and spoke with tongues. Yes. Praise God. Has anybody else reached out to pray for someone? Did anybody have just a thumbs up? Even if you give me a thumbs up real quick, did anybody have the, take the opportunity to pray for somebody? Did you do it? That was the challenge on Monday. Did you reach out? Did you offer to pray for someone? Did it come up? Praise God. You did. It was awesome. Great experience. You'll need to share that with us. That is awesome. Chris gave a thumbs up. That is awesome. Praise God. Joel, yes. Praise God, man. We got some people saying, yep, Char says yes. Melissa, yes. Joel, yes. Yay, guys. That is awesome. Prayed for somebody. You said, may I pray for you? Just, just you know, not just your normal run of the mill, but somebody talking. You said, can I pray for you? Praise God. Leona, yes. That's good. Jump start. Man, I am so fired up. Glory to God. That is awesome. Praise God. That is awesome. We're going to extend that challenge again next week and give you a chance to do it again, the rest of you to jump on board. I want you to look. Praise God. Liam had a fever, and his cousin prayed for him. That's great. Good. Praise God. That is awesome. Amen. All right, we're going to pray this again before we go. Pray this out loud. Heavenly Father, grant me the opportunity to pray for a stranger or to pray for someone outside of my family 
because of a conversation, grant me the opportunity to ask, can I pray for you right now? I thank you for that opportunity. So we're going to ask again next Friday, how many of you prayed for a stranger, prayed for a friend, uh, came up in a conversation, you had an opportunity to minister by praying? Love it, love it, love it. Have an awesome rest of the week. See you on Monday. Jumpstart Nation is an outreach of Byron Mills Ministries Incorporated. We want to thank you for being a part of our program today. And we want to thank our partners and faithful friends for supporting Jumpstart Nation and Byron Mills Ministries with your love, your prayers, your presence, and your financial support. If you'd like to contribute to Jumpstart Nation, go to byronmillsministries.com to the giving page. Thank you.